I looked at what you guys do, risk management. I think risk is just basically stress spelled backwards, isn't it? Isn't that really what you guys do? Because stress, with people stress, do stupid things, don't they? People with stress don't pay attention when they're driving. People with stress um, have a tendency to stick their things in holes on production lines and get their fingers cut off. You know, I, I work with, a, a, with a, uh, a food company, and they said last year we had 117 fingers that were lost. Now, here was the interesting thing. They have to do a report afterwards, right? How did this happen? So their director of safety says, now, Mike, here's the dumb question we asked those people. What were you thinking when you stuck your finger in there and he chopped it off? And you know what she said? Obviously they weren't or they wouldn't have stuck their finger in there, right? But we got to do this big report on it. And you know what? What they all said was, well, I was just trying to help. I was just trying to, you know, so we didn't have to shut it down. I just thought I could just real quick push that and lose my finger. Stressed people don't make good decisions, do they? So let's pretend you are married, okay, Eric? And Eric works for me, and he's a good guy, and I like Eric. And I go up to Eric, and I say, you know what, Eric? You do good work, buddy. Not much, but what you do is real good. <laughs> I only work yeah. part-time. You only work part-time, okay. Now... I said that, I'm trying to be a nice boss, guys. I said that to be just kind of a funny, nice boss. Now, when Eric gets home and says to his new wife, Colby, oh, guess what boss man just said? He said, I do nice work, not much, but what I do is real good, and he's laughing. Is Colby laughing? Uh-uh. Colby's probably going to say something like this. What do you think he meant by that? And you know what, guys? I didn't mean a thing about that. I was just trying to be a good guy. But because I'm the boss, everything I say and do is subjected to this process. It's discussed, it's dissected, and it's digested. Thank you much. Hand for Eric, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you much. All right? Three days of finding out that they were getting these promotions, all of a sudden these two women are stirring up the stuff and getting upset. And they're like, what's the deal? Well, here's what they found out. Every Wednesday, these two women went to the Chinese restaurant and they played a game with the fortune cookie and they added up the numbers and the person who had the highest number bought lunch. And if they were put in these new jobs, they'd be way far across town and they wouldn't be able to do that. The president of the company looked at me and says, Mike, when we thought about this redistribution of people, Chinese food did not enter my mind. Right? But they were afraid they were going to lose this familiarity. Smart company, here's what they did. They said, here's the deal, ladies. Once a month, once a week, you can meet at the Chinese place. We'll even pay your expenses and gas to go over there. Because you know what they discovered? The reason those women were so successful is what they talked about when they had lunch at that Chinese restaurant. All of a sudden, they started letting people be tapped that could go and join them for lunch. But that was a fear that they had about change. People don't mind the change. I'm afraid what it's going to do to me, what it's going to make me look like. I re and most people want to look good with their organizations. So they check into this hotel at midnight, and they are checking out of the hotel at 5 o'clock in the morning, right on schedule. And they go to check out, and the guy behind the desk hands my dad a bill for 350 bucks. My father says, 350 bucks? We're only here five hours. My wife made the bed because mom could never leave a room dirty, right? I mean, she just couldn't do it. And, and, and we said, well, sir, you don't understand. Last night, we had the cast from MASH here, Alan Alda, Loretta Swit, and, and, and they played Streetcar Named Desire, and, and the tickets for that were, were, were $100, and, and that was included. And we also had champagne and caviar, and that was included. That was another $50. My father says, huh, huh. Oh, oh, okay. He says, and then, and, and then this morning, he says, but I didn't go to any champagne and caviar, Alan Alda thing. He says, but sir, you could have. It was included. My father, mm hmm. He says, and then this morning, sir, um, we have champagne and, and caviar breakfast and, and eggs benedict, and, and that's another $100, and that's included. My dad says, I'm not going to drink any champagne before I drive the car. You're some kind of a nut. The guy said, but sir, it's included. You could have. My father said, give me that bill. And the guy gives my dad the bill, and my dad scribbles something on the bill. He reaches in his pocket, and he pulls out a $100 bill, and he hands it to the guy. And he hands him this note. And the guy says, sir, this is only $100.
My father says, read the note. The guy reads the note, $250 for sleeping with my wife. The guy said, I didn't sleep with your wife. My father said, you could have. <laughs> People like to be good at what they do. People are, like to be proud of what they do. Is that fair? I think so. I believe that most people want to feel at the end of the day when they went home that they put in a good day's work. I don't think most people want to goof off. I, th I believe most people want to do a good day's work. Now, example of where this uh, worked against the company. I was working with a manufacturing company. And what they did is it was kind of a rough and tumble business. They sheared steel. So it's real loud. You have to wear the headphones and the hard hats and all of this kind of stuff. And they had four men that worked for them. And their titles were called lead men. This is about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. And what these guys did is they were really kind of like sophisticated millwrights. What their job to do, if a piece of equipment went down, they kind of know how to whack it like that, kind of hold their tongue like that, and kind of whack it like that, and they could get the machine up and going. And these were all good employees. They showed up on time. They were good managers. People liked to be around them. They didn't do this, right? They didn't stir up the stuff, which a lot of people tell me is, you know, if we could just get people to stop doing this, it'd be a lot better. So they were great employees. One had been there 21 years, one had been there 18 years, another guy 16 years, another guy 14 years. All of a sudden, these guys are stirring up the stuff, they're showing up late, you know, they're sticking sticks in people's spokes. And it got like, what's the problem? Why are these guys become such miserable employees? Well, what these guys found out, I got somebody laughing back there, sounds like he's already been there. What these guys found out is that in nine months, this equipment that they were so good at whacking with the hammer and holding their tongue like that and kind of kicking like that was all going to be replaced and all of the stuff was going to be replaced with instrumentation. Okay? It was all going to work like this. No more this, all like this. Well, here's the problem. Three of those four guys couldn't really read. One of them couldn't really do numbers that well. So what did these guys realize? In nine months, we're going to be obsolete, we're going to be laughing stocks, we're going to be just fodder. The company found it out, and I have a lot of admiration for what this company, for this company and what it did. It took a retired first grade school teacher, first grade, and they paid her to do leadership training for these four men. And three times a week, they went to leadership training, and she taught these guys how to read. Now, that's an incredible investment on the part of that company. Now, most companies say, well, what the heck with them? If they can't read, we just got to get rid of them. Here's what they said. 23 years ago, when John came to work for us, he didn't have to read. He just had to do this. So as far as we're concerned, job training is teaching these guys how to read. And one of the things I share with organizations when they're going through major changes is some people don't give people permission to change, do they? Once a jerk, always a jerk. And the problem is people's lives are constantly changing. People can have near-death experiences and get religion. People can stop drinking. People can stop taking drugs. People, people can become nice persons if we give them that permission to change. But if I keep somebody in that nice, neat box that they're never going to buy into this, it's probably never going to happen. I have to put a change management program attached to something new or it's not going to work. Think of change in these terms. I like to think of change in the terms of change units. You have a new change initiative. It doesn't matter what it is. You're introducing a new product. You're taking on a new line. You're doing a new marketing campaign. And basically what's supposed to happen is it's supposed to happen right here. It's supposed to start here, and the plan says that it's supposed to end here. Makes all the sense in the world, the model works, but what typically happens is the change program doesn't end here, it ends up over here. It's kind of like body surfing in the ocean. If I'm body surfing and I get knocked down, when I go to get up, if I don't time when that next wave is, I'm going to get knocked down again. So what happens is organizations come up with the greatest plan in the world. They don't spend the amount of time looking at the change management aspect, and so things start to go wrong. People decide that they're not going to include the other team. People decide that it's not my day to worry about that. All of those kinds of issues start to play in. And what happens is your change, issue, or your change unit has a tendency to go over where it was supposed to be. The problem is next change unit is supposed to start, 
and now you've got overlapping change units. What people really want is if you're going to introduce change, I want the change to go to about here and maybe end about 8% early so I get a chance to oh, just kind of take a breath because that's what's so important to me about the change is I want a chance to breathe. People don't have breathing room.